Hello, my name's Ash, and my garden doesn't normally look like this. <laughs> Let's do some ice dyeing. So the basic idea with ice dyeing is that you put the stuff you want to dye with ice, or in this case snow, on top, and then powdered dyes on top of that. And as the ice or snow melts, the dyes mix with the water, separate, are applied unevenly to the fabric. And at this point you know about as much about it as I did on the morning that I woke up and saw that there was literally a foot of snow on top of the car. It's March. This is England. This kind of weather doesn't happen. <sighs> but if we are going to have a climate crisis, might as well have fun with it. So I needed some kind of container to put them in, so I used some plastic storage boxes that I'm not currently using. The guide that I found recommended that you put a mesh or grill on top of something in the box. You want to raise up whatever you're dyeing, because when the ice or snow melts, it's going to run down into the bottom and pool, and you don't really want your yarn sitting in a pool of dye, because then it will just be a normal dye bath, right? I did not have anything suitable, so we improvised. I stuffed some paper scraps left over from pattern making into some plastic bags, and then for some reason I have a load of the metal tops of hanging files from a filing cabinet. It's a long story. I had a bunch of those, just made my own mesh. Was it good? No, but it was acceptable for this one time. Then obviously I needed whatever I was going to dye, so I had I think seven skeins of this 100% wool Aran that was white. I'd always intended to dye it, I've just never got around to it. Now feels like the time, you know? I also had a alpaca and rayon mix that I wasn't sure how it was going to go, it's also not completely white, and a lamb's wool three ply from an indie yarn brand. I had some other yarns that I thought I was going to use, I ended up not having enough space in the tubs, and the snow didn't last that long so we didn't get to do a second round. It's fine. More adventures in dyeing in the future, obviously. So obviously the first thing was to wind that yarn into skeins rather than balls. For some some reason I couldn't find my normal size nitty noddy. I had to use the mini one. Not ideal, but we got there. In case you don't know, a nitty noddy is a tool for winding yarn, and yes, that is its real name. I don't know what to tell you. Spinning is weird. And once I'd wound it into skeins, I also used some scrap yarn to just add some figure eight ties through the yarn. That makes sure everything stays in place and doesn't get tangled up. The guide I used didn't say to do the next step, but when I dyed wool before, this is what I did. So instead of just dampening the yarn, I actually soaked it in a bucket of water with some vinegar. Modern wool dyes are what's called acid dyes. They're activated by an acid, in this case a very weak acid, it's just regular white vinegar. The guide I followed said to add the acid at the end, and I did that too, so I can't actually tell you whether this is necessary or not, it just made me feel better. So I soaked all the yarn in water with a couple of tablespoons of vinegar in, not a lot, you don't actually need a lot. Arranged it in the buckets and then carried it outside, where I covered them with snow. Once they were covered in snow, I then sprinkled the powdered dyes on top. The dyes I'm using are called landscape dyes, they are I believe an Australian brand. I really like them because the colours are really vivid. A lot of dyes are very concentrated, so you have to use a small amount in a pre-dilution and then a bigger dilution, and I, I'm not about that life. The landscape dyes are bulked out, so instead of using grams of dye in a couple hundred millilitres of water, with the landscape dyes you actually end up using like tablespoons. I find that gives you just a lot more room for error. The results usually come out closer to what I'm expecting, although of course the beauty of ice dyeing, snow dyeing, is that the results of that are kind of random and uncontrollable. If I was doing this scientifically I would have tried out a couple of different methods, I would have used some different dyes, I would have used ice on one of them and not snow, I probably would have experimented with acid at the beginning versus acid at the end versus both, and maybe I'll do that in a future video. For this one I was just having fun. So I sprinkled a bunch of different dyes on top of the snow and ice, and then I carried the boxes inside and put them somewhere reasonably warm, room temperature, and just waited for the snow to melt. This ended up being, I think, it was overnight, so maybe 
14 hours. It, this was a long process. Once all the snow had melted, pretty much, there was a tiny bit left in one of them. I was bored. I wasn't going to wait any longer. I carried the tubs into my bathtub because that seemed like a smart move. Dye gets everywhere. I took the skeins out one by one. I squeezed out as much liquid as possible. And at that point, I sprayed them down with another solution of vinegar and water. Again, it was like a tablespoonful of vinegar in a spray bottle of water. It's not a lot, but I squeezed them out. I sprayed them down with the vinegar solution and then I put them into Ziploc bags because the next thing that the dyes need to become colored fast and not wash out is heat. And I find the easiest way to apply heat to wool that you are dyeing is to stick it in the microwave. So each skein of yarn dyed a little bit differently. So each skein of yarn went into its own bag. That bag went into the microwave for, I think I did like a minute and then flipped it over and then another minute. I'm not sure that the break in the middle actually did anything at all, but it made me feel better. I also wasn't confident that that was long enough, but I found that my Ziploc free bags lost structural integrity after about two and a half minutes of microwaving, which is not ideal. There we are. I ended up microwaving them for about two minutes per skein, and then they all got put to one side and left to cool completely. So the reason why I like using the microwave so much is because there's basically no movement of the yarn, because if you have hot, wet wool that you then agitate, it'll felt. The microwave is a great way of heating wet wool without agitating it. However, one of the other things that will get wet wool to felt is thermal shock, sudden changes in temperature. So if you take your hot microwaved wool that is wet and dunk it into cold water, it's going to felt. You're not going to have nice yarn at the end of it. So they got left to one side to cool completely. This took like six hours, maybe four. It was a while. Okay, they were hot. But once they'd all cooled down completely, I then took them back to the bathtub and just gently rinsed them in some tubs of water. I was really pleased to see that very little dye washed out. It didn't take much to get the water to run clear. It was almost completely clear anyway. That's a really good sign. It means that the wool has absorbed the dye molecules and they're not running off. I then treated it the same way I would treat wool that have spun, squeeze out as much water as possible, squeeze out the water again by pressing pressing it inside of a towel. I know some people don't like to do this, but if as long as you don't rub it, it's not going to felt. If you just squeeze even pressure, I've never had that ruin the yarn. And then I hung it up to dry with a towel underneath because you will take these skeins out and you'll be like, oh, these are quite dry. They'll dry very quickly. And then you hang them and within minutes they are dripping because wool lies. Wool lies about how wet it is. It is one of the good and bad features of wool. Also, wet wool is not a great example of what the final colours are going to look like. So it was actually like another day and a half before I got a really good look at what I'd produced. The ice dyeing projects that I'd seen had all been on fabric and on cotton. And I think both the cotton dyes will behave very differently because it's a very different kind of dye. And also on fabric, I think you're going to pick up the the variation and splitting of the dye much more obviously. Also, maybe I just used way more dye, which is a distinct possibility. So the effect that I got wasn't quite what I was expecting, but I think it was still really cool. The variegation is kind of subtle, but I think that's quite good for yarn that's going to be then knitted up into something or crocheted, but probably knitted. You've got this really gentle like variation in colour, not just in patches across the length of the yarn, which is what you normally get if you're like dyeing it in a bath or something. Just this really random like mottling, I thought was very cool, very nice, liked it very much. Some colours seemed to basically disappear entirely, like I'm sure there was green went into brownish orange batch and I'm pretty sure I put blue in with the pinky purples, and neither of which seemed to have appeared at all. Then again I think maybe they just mixed and blended and split within that dye bath and that's how we ended up with so many different colours. Generally, my takeaway from this was that it was a surprisingly easy project. It was messy, but it didn't need a whole lot of... I didn't need a lot of specialist equipment. It was a lot less intensive than getting a big dye bath up to boiling temperature or whatever, you know, normal dyeing things. I think if you'd never dyed anything before and you were interested to give it a go, this could actually be a lot of fun and quite an easy way in 
into the um, into the craft. You're not going to have a lot of control over what the results are, but in some ways that's what makes it so much fun and so accessible. I think that's probably enough of that nonsense for now, and I'm definitely not contemplating getting back into dyeing in a really big way. Never really done fabric, never done silk, never done cotton, never done tie-dye. Basically a whole field of crafts that I've I've only dipped my toe into. I'm not even getting into like the plants. Ooh, I could die with plants. Hmm. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, don't forget to like, comment and subscribe to keep the YouTube gods happy. Follow me on Instagram if you'd like to see pictures of my cat. And down in the description box, you'll find a link to my Ko-fi page where you can make a one-off or reoccurring donation to support this channel and my inevitable slide towards cultivating my own woad. And I only say that because you can't grow indigo in this country very well. God, I love indigo. I massively appreciate every single one of my Ko-fi supporters and you guys make these videos happen. Potentially some of you wish that I would stay on topic and do the things that you actually supported me for instead of random wild projects, but uh, you knew what you were getting yourselves into. Kofi supporters get early access to all of my videos, the occasional backstage peek, and permanent access to things like live streams, which eventually go unlisted from the channel. And with nothing more to add, and uh, a whole heap of LARP kit projects staring me in the face, thank you so much for watching. Dream big, and I'll see you next time.